Welcome listeners. I'm Miriam Merrill, Chair of Physical Education Department and the Director of Pomona Pitzer Athletics. We are celebrating the 50th anniversary of Title IX, which is the landmark education amendment of 1972. Pomona Pitzer is highlighting our own implementation of Title IX with a series of events and programs, including a three-part docu-series of conversations with various students, alumni, and coaches who played a vital role in Title IX. I'm joined today by Sue Gozanski, former assistant coach for Pomona Pitzer Women's Volleyball. Welcome, Sue. Hi, thank you. It's a pleasure to be on. Great to have you. Everyone, Sue's accomplishments are so extensive. After graduating Kenesha High School in Pomona, Sue was a six-sport star at Kyle Poly Pomona and then a two-sport star at UCLA in volleyball and basketball. She was a member of the USA National Volleyball Team and then served as a volleyball coach at UC Riverside from 1970 to 2008, winning three national championships. She was the UCR Assistant Athletic Director and Associate Athletic Director and Senior Woman Administrator. She's a member of five Halls of Fame, yes, I said five, and has written two books. Sue served as Pomona Pitzer's Assistant Volleyball Coach from 2009 to 2012. Sue, we are so happy you're here with us. Thank you. I'm excited about being here and talking about my passion, which is women's sports. Awesome. So let's get into the interview because I'm really excited to hear about your story. And I'm going to talk you through kind of some questions and maybe in in a couple of different parts. So first, maybe let's talk about you as an athlete and then we'll kind of go into hearing about your experience as a coach and then later as an athletic administrator. So let's start to talk about an athlete. So growing up in the late 1950s and early 60s, um, you know, you went to Ganesha High School. So what sorts of opportunities did you have when you were growing up as it relates to sports? Well, my dad was a professional um, softball player, fast pitch softball, and my mom said she was athletic, (laughs) but I'm not too sure about that. So we were an athletic family, and I love sports from from, uh, a young age, but there were very few opportunities for females, and my brother entered a cookie contest where he said why he loved these animal crackers, and we won a tennis racket. And with the tennis racket, we started playing tennis um, at the park in Los Angeles and took the free lessons in the summer. So both my brother and I played for years, and that was my first sport. And then I ended up playing in Southern California tournaments and was a ranked player. But that was something that there was available for, for females at Ganesha High School, we had uh, Girls Athletic Association, GAA, and we had play days, but we had no sports uh, for girls. And because I was a tennis player, I practiced with the boys team, and they asked me to play on the team, but CIF would not allow me to play in competition. So there was an article in the school paper early on that said, um, tennis team mourns loss of new recruit. And I thought, <laughs> wait a minute, I'm still here. Right. Um, but but that was my experiences in uh, at Ganesha High School. And um, at the time, in the 50s and 60s, sports really wasn't a popular uh, situation for female athletes, and it was considered um, not very feminine. So socially, it wasn't really acceptable, so we were sort of fighting that issue, and tennis was more acceptable because you wore those cute little skirts, and my mom made them for me. Mm -hmm. So you had a cute tennis dress, so that was better. In track and field, the women had these fancy hairdos, and they wore nail polish, and they, they dressed up to look really feminine so that they were more acceptable too. But those times were difficult, and at the same time, the last thing is they, many men especially, thought that it was dangerous for women to be involved in sport. And a good friend of mine, Gail Roper, who swam in the 1956 Olympics in Melbourne, Australia, she saw all the men on her training squad uh, swimming a mile, and she thought, well, I can do that. And so one day she went to practice real early and jumped in the pool and was swimming back and forth and back and forth. And her coach saw her and he goes, Gail, get out of the pool. You'll never have children. Wow. And um, 
So she she ended up having six kids, so obviously that wasn't the sure. case. But those were the times. Few opportunities, not real socially acceptable, not popular, and considered dangerous in some aspects. Mm-hmm. So you talked about, you know, being connected to the boys team uh, and it just being sports being dominated by uh, boys and men back then. Were there any female athletic role models that you had that you can think of kind of back then? Or Well, that was a sort of a difficult question because there was so little publicity for sports in general and definitely not with females. So Darlene Hart, that that went to school at Pomona and played on the tennis team and became an international star. I knew who she was. I didn't know she went to Pomona at the time. But Billie Jean King, obviously, because she's a great player, and Althea Gibson and um, Francois Dour that was um, from from France. Um, but she had some interesting strokes, so I was always sort of curious how she hit her backhand the way she did. But in general, I don't know if I could call them um, heroes, but they were somewhat role models for me. That's great. That's great. So thinking about your Cal Poly experience, right, pre-Title IX. So I know my experience is post-Title IX. So um, women in sports, it just was, right? Um, So can you talk about what it was like to play six different sports, kind of pre-Title IX? And again, for those of you who forget, it was volleyball, basketball, tennis, softball, track and field, and badminton. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Well, when I left Ganesha High School and with very few opportunities— and I went to Cal Poly as a physical education major, I was so excited. Um, I was loved the idea that there was organized sport, we played in a league, and we had coaches. What were those? We actually had coaches. And so for me, that was an exciting time. And even though it was pre-Title IX and there weren't as many opportunities, that was a great opportunity for me, and I fit in. In high school, being a female athlete wasn't that popular, and a lot of the popular girls didn't do it. But at Cal Poly, it was popular, and the seasons were short, so you could go from one season to another, and the practices were hard, but you could practice one sport and then practice another. They made that available for you. So it was fun, it was acceptable, and so I was in heaven. I I loved it. Yeah, I bet. You talk about, you know, being able to fit in and to be able to just play with people who, like, look like you, right, other women, I imagine that just allowed you to enjoy the sport even more. Yes, and the men loved it too. Mm-hmm. So we were great friends with all the men on the men's team, so there was no separation. Uh, they probably had more than we did at the time, but that wasn't an issue with me. It was, I had the opportunity. It was fun. Mm-hmm. That's great. Uh, so I'm interested in hearing about your uh, transition to UCLA. So you played volleyball and basketball at UCLA. Uh, what was your experience like uh, at UCLA? Was it different from uh, your experience at Cal Poly Pomona, or were there some similarities between those two? There were more similarities and differences because at the time, many of the schools, which I can talk about later, but many of the schools played in the same leagues. So being at UCLA wasn't that much different than being at Cal Poly. But the difference was that you were at a higher level of competition. The athletes were stronger and the level of play was much higher. And when I first started out, playing basketball was was no problem. And I remember playing at USC and against someone that I'm sure you know, Donna Lopiano, who started the Women's Sports Foundation and has done everything along with Billie Jean King to get women to where they are today with sports opportunities. But she was at USC. She was a great player, a great softball player, and I got to play against her. On the volleyball team, when we played USC, they had two Olympians. One was a a javelin thrower and another one, Mickey McFadden, who was an Olympic volleyball player. And I started off not being nearly as good from my standpoint as many of the players, but I had an opportunity to develop as a player. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made to go to graduate school at UCLA because little did I know then, but playing on the team 
at the school. Then they asked me to play on their club team, so I played USA Volleyball, Open Nationals, and at that time they chose players for the national team off of all-stars from other teams. So then I was asked to play on the national team. And so every for that decision to attend UCLA got me going as an athlete. I always wanted to be good at one sport, not mm-hmm. just play all six, but be really good at one. And, and UCLA gave me that opportunity. Um, so I'm really grateful for that decision and grateful for the people that I met at UCLA that, that got me to where I, I ended up being with a great career. That's great. So if you could think of maybe one memory or something that stands out to you about your experience as a student athlete at both either both or either Cal Poly Pomona or UCLA, what what stands out to you or what what is that one memory you're like, oh, I remember this? Well, probably I've already mentioned it because I just had so much fun. uh, And that that is my biggest memory. And my biggest memory at UCLA was was being able to go to nationals with many of my teammates. And that very first year, we were able to, I was um, chosen Rookie of the Year for the United States for that program and later on, you know, playing on on the team. And my coach at UCLA was a big reason for that. So that, that is my biggest memory. That's awesome. Uh, So now I want to switch kind of a little bit into gender equity as it relates to you being a student athlete. Uh, When you were a college student at both Cal Poly Pomona and UCLA, what did you know about uh, gender equity? Was that something that people were talking about on campus or? Pretty much as an athlete, that never came up. I really do believe we didn't feel entitled. We were happy with what we had at the time. It changed when I became uh, a coach and when I became an administrator and things started really happening in women's sports. But as an athlete, uh, I don't really remember very much at all other than just um, enjoying the opportunities that we had at that moment because they were a lot more than we had earlier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, you know, I remember, again, Title IX was not really a thing we, it just was, right? Like women played sports. But I remember probably maybe my sophomore year at the University of Cincinnati, the institution decided to drop uh, men's track and field. And so that's really when I learned a lot more about Title IX and what it was, because we know that a lot of institutions try to use this quick fix as to like kind of cut sports. So um, I when you talk about you know, not really paying too much attention to it. I think it was the same thing for me until, uh, you know, a men's team was, was dropped. And Title IX started in 1972. I started coaching in 1970, but my playing was all pretty much before any of that started. And I really didn't play too much after that because I had a knee injury. And in a way, it was a it was a good thing because... I didn't think about myself as much as an athlete and thinking, well, hey, I'm better than you are. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I could do that. Why can't you do that? I became a coach. And so the transition was immediate as from a player to a coach. And then in 1970, when I started coaching, um, that's when I began thinking about the discrepancies. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about that a little <clears throat> bit further. You know, over time, and you've been in the business, right, for, for a large, uh, great amount of time. So what have you kind of seen, the progression of Title IX and, or the impact of Title IX, I guess I should say, kind of over the years? What, is, what have you observed? Well, it's pretty fun and a little bit funny what happened at the beginning because I'll give you a little pre-Title IX history. And in 1970, when I started at UC Riverside, we had punch and cookies for the opponents. I hated that because I was very competitive. And if we beat somebody, I wanted to celebrate. And I didn't want them around. If we lost, I wanted them just to get out of there. Uh Um, So we had punch and cookies. And we continued that for, for a few years. We had no training room. The, the men had a training room, but the only way to get into the training room was through the men's locker room. And so after a few years, one night, some of my players and I knocked a hole in the wall from the women's locker room to get into the training room. 
So we didn't have that. We, you don't have the strength training. We, our uniforms, we were given a uniform for the season, and that same uniform went from volleyball in the fall to basketball in the winter to softball in the spring. And one year we decided to sew our own uniform tops because we thought, well, then we'd have our own. Wow. But um, I guess we didn't have any Martha Stewart's or Seamstress because that was a disaster. Uh, but we didn't have a lot of things. Uh, and and with Title IX, then you started to to see the opportunities and realize that, hey, this is this is not fair, and we deserve just as much as the boys and the men. And so then we started fighting for that. But it, it was a different world early on. And one of the things about the athletes, because women didn't have very many opportunities, there, most women didn't know the word hustle. Hmm. What did that mean? And how, how, how do I become competitive and how do I meet the expectations that my new coach has for me and the commitment that she wants me to have for this sports program? And that took a while to develop, and clubs helped that to give women more opportunities and young girls. Sure. And you talk about, you know, not being able to get to the training facility unless you go through the men's locker room. Like that is truly the definition of lack of access, right? Like you can literally (laughs) not access the resources available to you. Yeah, that's true. Wow. Good comment. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about you and your coaching, uh, both men and women. What was your experience like being a woman coaching a men's team? I guess I had a lot of confidence because it was easy. I I had no problem with it, and when I first started coaching men, it was at UC Riverside, and we had a team that was within the intercollegiate athletic department, and they knew my background. I mean, I had just come from the USA team, so they respected me, and with men, I had to be a little bit more decisive, a little bit uh, stronger in what I did because that's what they needed. For the women, if you were friendly and they liked you, even if you didn't know as much about the sport, uh, they were going to enjoy you as a coach and do what you said. But with the men, you had to be decisive for them to respect you. But it wasn't a problem. I was very confident because of my background, and I loved it. We had a great time. We had a, a very good good team. And later on with the Maccabea teams for Jewish athletes, I coached the men in Israel, the group of USA athletes in Israel. So that was international play. And that was interesting because most of the officials didn't know me there as they did here. And um, so oftentimes an official or another coach would always go up to my male assistant coach or to the trainer and they would think that person was the head coach and not me. That was a little annoying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, they they realized very quickly that, that I was the coach. And I had some good advice from our 1984 Olympic gold medal men's coach for the USA team. And he just said, go up to the officials before the match, introduce yourself, let them know who you are, and that you are the head coach, and discuss some things with them, show them that you are a competent coach. So pretty much I just had a great experience. I loved coaching men. They were a little physically stronger, and they were very competitive, which I loved. And so that that situation uh, worked out, because you could do a lot of things that you couldn't do with the women at that time. You could run a, a stronger offense. You could run a quicker offense. So that that worked out really well. That's great. Yeah, I coached uh, men's track and field back whenever I lived in Chicago. And what I would get um, from other people is, why don't you coach the women's team? But the women's team was coached by a man. And I, I remember asking him one day, do you get asked why you coach women? He was like, no. Or the, the girls, I'm sorry. And he was like, no. I was like, hmm, interesting. Yeah, and I think it's really a great situation for men to see that women – 
can do this. You're a role model not only for women, but for men understanding that women can be in this position and their sisters can do it and their mothers can do it. And that's a great situation. And I'm continuing coaching uh, boys now, high school, at Claremont High School, boys volleyball. And it's, it's, it's great and it's nice to be able to promote volleyball for boys. Mm-hmm. So now I want to talk a little bit about the AIAW. Um, this certainly is something that I learned a little bit more about um, as I work through my dissertation work. Um, certainly everybody hears about the NCAA, but the AIAW for a lot of younger women just really isn't something we know about. And I know that you have been really involved over your career with the AIAW. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what it was like and kind of your um interaction within the organization and, and, yeah, maybe educate our listeners on what the AIAW was. So AIAW stands for Association for Intercollegiate Athletics for Women, and that was the first organization to govern women's collegiate athletics that existed. And that started, they were founded in 1971, 1972, and they, there wasn't the NCAA since their existence in 1905 or 1906, never had athletics for women. So the AIW saw that there was a need, and they started championships for women. They had an ideal philosophy, idealistic philosophy, where there was to be no scholarships or no recruiting, and they didn't want to get into the situation where they saw the men's programs maybe a little bit corrupt, maybe a little too big business, and where academics may became second instead of first. So they wanted an organization for women that maybe had a slightly different philosophy. And the NCAA didn't think women uh, were interested in athletics, so they didn't promote it. So I was involved from the very beginning in that organization, and we first started in the ni- in 1970 with the Western AIAW, WAIW. So we were Region 8 in Southern California, and there was lots of meetings where we were organizing different different aspects of what was we were going to be having in the national scene. And I actually ran the very first. Western AIW regional championships. It was held at Santa Barbara, and we had many of the the schools here represented for for volleyball. So basically, I served on a lot of those committees. In 1974, was the very first delegate assembly for AIW, and I represented UC Riverside there, and I went to every delegate assembly as a member. And I was on many committees, one of which was obviously volleyball, which is what I was doing the most for. And um, I attended the very last one in 1981. And when, I guess, if you want me to continue with some of the the transition and pitfalls, but in 1981, when the NCAA saw that women did want to participate and that the AIW had been so successful with their championships and were becoming a very powerful organization. And in fact, there were many TV contracts in in the wraps for the NCAA, in my opinion, thought, well, we don't want this competition. Uh, so, So all of a sudden, they chose in their 1981 convention to add women's championships. So in the long run, maybe it was a good situation, but in the short run, it was very difficult. And the men made it easy for institutions to make that decision because they paid for all travel for regional and national championships, whereas the AIW didn't have the financial means to do that at the time. NCAA offered the situation where there would be one set of rules rather than two sets of rules with AIAW and the NCAA. And if you want to look at it this way, 
and we did as as women, the men would be in control. So the women that were running for over 10 years, the women's programs, now that was under the jurisdiction of the male athletic director. Some women had a little bit more say so than others, but many of them lost lost their jobs. And as women's sports became more competitive, men had more experience in doing that. So many of the men were given the jobs as coaches that women previously had. So it was a difficult situation for women because many of them lost their jobs, either as coaches or administrators. And it took a little while before that change, but it's still a problem today where that equity uh, doesn't exist. Yeah, I'm so glad you shared that um, because I don't think a lot of our listeners know that. And like I said, it wasn't until my dissertation work that I was like, oh, right. And that there was a television deal with <clears throat> the AIAW basketball championship. And then and see, it was like, oh, there's some money over here. And, uh, and I'm glad you also highlighted just that there you know, were women's athletic departments and, and the men's and the women who were governing, governing um, you know, the coaches and, and supporting and the administrators and all of that. Whenever the two um, departments merged, women were the ones that often lost their job. And so as um, a way to kind of recognize that, you know, the NCAA came up with the senior woman administrator position as a way to make sure that there was a woman kind of in there making decisions. Yes, and I was in that position for for a number of years, but you still never had the same power or the same ability for input as you did before. So it it was a difficult situation. And I think the saddest part for all of us that were involved from the very beginning with AIAW was that we took a program that didn't exist to a program that was a great program and a powerful program. And we went through all the growing pains of taking a program from basically nothing to a very competitive championship. So it was sad to see all of a sudden in one or two days that that was all gone. And again, as I mentioned, maybe it was a good thing because the NCA had years and years of experience. They had a great financial base. They had a very good promotion. And so they could offer things that would have still taken us a while to to get. But nevertheless, we did all the hard work and there were a lot of battles to fight. And a lot of those battles were not fun. Mm-hmm. They were very, very difficult. And I am so grateful to all those women that fought the battles. I think I fought the fun battles because we were a little further along. But nevertheless, that that was a sad day for us. And because of the financial resources that the NCAA had, the AIW didn't have any members left. So that was the the end of, of an era for, for AIAW. Mm-hmm. So you've educated us on the AIAW. Uh, how about the the SCWIAC? <laughs> that was at the SQIAC. How did you all say that? Because most of us know of the SCIAC. Um, so tell us about that. You know, it's funny. I, I don't even remember how to say that because it was so <laughs> long ago. But it's interesting because basically the SCWIAC was the organization And you could say it was like the AIAW because the Ski Act didn't have programs for women. And they started in 1915, and Pomona Pitzer was one of the founding members of Ski Act. But um, they didn't have programs for, for women. So the SCW, the Southern California Women's Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, offered that. Um, Prior to that, and I'm really good with these initials. Prior to that, from like 1961 to 68, was the ECC-SCC. 
the Extramural Coordinating Council for Southern California Colleges. So that preceded the SCWIAC. And in that were all the Southern California women's teams. That included not just Pomona Pitzer and UC Riverside, but that included USC and UCLA and Pepperdine and Long Beach. And there were divisions, so some teams like UCLA and Long Beach had an A team and a B team and a C team. Long Beach had a D team, I remember. Wow. And so UC Riverside was in the uh, SEWIAC along with some other schools, and not Pomona Pitzer. But with tennis, we were with Pomona Pitzer, and we were with Pomona Pitzer with badminton. So the SEWIAC was all the Southern California conferences or universities. They had different divisions, and we got together in a room with all the schools, and we decided who should play who and who should be with who that would be somewhat equitable with the competitiveness of the team. So once once that that changed, then SCWIC took over and had men's and women's programs. Sure. Um, so let's talk about general kind of Title IX scorecards. So if you were to give a score or kind of tell us where you think we're at, how are we doing as it relates to Title IX? And if you do think there are work that needs to be done, like, what would you suggest? What what work still needs to be done? Well, there is a lot of work to be done, and it just depends on your perspective how you look at this. I'm a pretty positive person, and I am so grateful to be where we are today. A lot of the athletes today, well, the majority of athletes today, have no idea of how lucky they are to be living now in this situation and a lot of them feel pretty entitled that they they deserve all of this. Well, it took a long time to get this, and many of us didn't have these opportunities. So one, I'm grateful because I think we have, you know, you've made we've made a big move forward. But at the same time, equity does not exist today, uh, especially salaries for women coaches, salaries for professional athletes. Many more men are coaching women's teams than women. Males dominate the administration of women's athletics. There are just a lot of lot of areas where we could be a lot better. So there's still lots of battles to be fought and we need to do it in a positive way. But we need to still fight for getting the things that we think are important for for our athletes. Mm-hmm. And I think I just read the other day about Don Staley uh, being the first kind of female coach that has tipped into the million dollar mark as it relates to making money. But we think about you know all of the football cha- coach changes that are happening now, and they're making millions and millions. They are M- many of well football, basketball somewhat in baseball, and now because of equity in Title IX, because women's basketball is compared to men's basketball, equity exists better in that situation. Because of football, you have to find another sport where for women that you want to give that um, prominence to, but it's more of the smaller, the minor sports that are suffering quite a bit more and because money is a huge factor, and when there's not enough money, something has to give. And we used to always say if the men would lower their standard of living, the male athletic programs, then the female athletic programs could exist at a higher level. But once you're given something, it's very difficult to take it away. So there, there is work to be done, but... We have come so far that I'm very positive about those those steps forward, and we need to continue to do that so we don't slip back, which always can happen. 
Yeah, and I think that's what scares me about kind of the pay for play, you know, paying student athletes is, you know, how do we guarantee that women, right? Women and men, when you go to practice, you're doing the same amount of quote unquote work, right? So how do we make sure if we end up paying student athletes, which you know that's not what I'm saying. I, I really don't think we should, uh, but I'm I'm nervous that if that happens, that what we'll find ourselves doing is paying male student athletes a lot of money. And then uh, female student athletes, uh, nothing comparable. So, uh, but for doing the exact same quote unquote work. Right? It's interesting because in some areas, they're thinking that women will really benefit from this pay for play. I don't know whether that'll actually happen or not. But you bring up an interesting point with where we are with athletics today. It's big business. And I was in a small part part of that as a Division I coach in the Big West Conference at UC Riverside. And when I came to help at Pomona Pitzer, I really saw, again, something that I already knew, but it was just more clear in my mind that Division Three is the best mm -hmm. place to be for athletics because the university is providing a part of an experience along with the academic experience and athletic experience as the mission of the university. And that's what Pomona Pitzer does. And I think the early days of AIAW that promoted that idealistic philosophy was important. And I just remembered now, but in the SCWIAC when this was all coming down, they, the coaches in that organization, were philosophically opposed to giving scholarships. But uh, the bigger schools like UCLA and Long Beach and USC wanted to do that. So at the very first delegate assembly in 1974, it was voted to have scholarships. And ideally, it was to be based more on financial need but that very quickly <laughs> changed. Sure. Yeah, and that's really well said. You know, that's exactly why I feel so passionately connected to Division Three. right? It is truly what college athletics um, w was meant to be. So I want to transition and talk a little bit about Renwick Gym, Renwick, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a.k.a., for those of you who don't know, the Woodpecker Heaven. Uh, tell us what you remember about the gym. Well, I remember it definitely as an athlete because at Cal Poly Pomona, we competed against Pomona Pitzer, and I played basketball in that gym, I played volleyball in that gym, and I played badminton, and I had a really special match playing badminton, so I definitely remember it completely, and I remember looking through the slats <laughs> in the walls, and you could see the outside. From wow. the inside, you could see the outside. <laughs> it was a rickety old gym, and it seemed like it was in the middle of nowhere. And um, my badminton story, just to bring up uh, Stan Hales and his wife, Diane Hales, and I guess Stan Hales went to school at Pomona College and was a singles national champion for um, badminton, and his wife... He and his wife won the same year for the national championship, and they were helping at Cal Poly at one point and taught me the game, and that, that's how I was playing badminton at, at, at Renwick. But the thing about Renwick that, that I remember the most is at the time, it was considered the women's gym, and the new facility was the men's gym. And I thought to myself, why? Is this the women's gym? Why can't we play in a nicer facility? And so as an athlete, that was one of the things that I did think about from an equity standpoint, because at Cal Poly Pomona, we built a new gym too. And the old gym then became the women's gym. And I thought, well, at least call it the old and the new. Let's not mm -hmm. call it women's and men's. Right. But, but Renwick was, was a fun place to be. <laughs> But it was old and rickety. <laughs> that is exactly what I've heard. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, kind of your experience and how uh, sports has impacted you. 
So how did you use the lessons you've learned from your time as a student athlete to better apply yourself to both the workforce and just in life in general? Well, sport does teach a lot of lessons, which is why I think many of those lessons can't be learned in a classroom and they can be learned in a sport setting. And individual sports are a little different than team sports, and I've I've done both. And I really like the lessons that you can learn as a, in a team sport because you're working with, with other people. But you definitely learn to be confident in yourself because you cannot be successful without being confident. And you learn to strive for excellence. And I, I think you learn to be your very best. And if you look around the world, I don't think that's something that's prominent. I always say it, it looks to me like they're striving to be average. And on my teams, you're striving to be excellent. And you learn to do that by setting goals. And you learn to reach those goals with lots of failure and setbacks and adversity. And if you can get through that with a good coach teaching you those lessons and walking you through it, um, you can you can be very successful in your life because all those things that will happen to you in sport will happen to you at some point in your life. Mm-hmm. Well said. Um, so if you had one thing to share with us that's your greatest accomplishment, and I'll actually give you two because you have quite a lot of them. <laughs> uh, what is the greatest accomplishment, one or two, uh, of your career? I do have more than one. Go ahead. Well, obviously, I am so proud of all the All-Americans that I've had and winning three national championships because as a coach, that is your goal. And if you can reach that, that's fantastic. But I'm also really proud of some of my teams that lost because they reached their potential. They worked as hard as they could, and, and they, they got as far as they could. And I'm proud of that. And um, when we made the transition from Division Two to Division One at the university, we lost a lot. And those players were Division Two players who were now playing in Division One, And they played as hard as they could with no regrets. And I'm really proud of that. Um, I'm also proud of the time that I helped grow volleyball because it started off really as a not the power sport that it is today. And I'm really proud of the time that I spent helping women's sports grow. And then just the impact that I had, hopefully on lots of my players, that they became confident, mature young ladies. And I, and I think their participation in sport helped. And I hope that I was a part of that. That's awesome. So in closing, I mean, you've talked about a lot, and I'm sure our listeners have learned a lot from the AIAW to what it's like to juggle six sports. Um, So is there anything else you would like to share with our Curtin student athletes or anything that you want us to know? I, I mentioned it earlier, but I want the student athletes to know how lucky they are to be living at this time where they have so many opportunities, not just in sport, but in their careers if they choose to have one after after they graduate from college. And I've met, I know, lots of the Pomona College athletes and the Pitzer athletes, and they're just unbelievable people who have great goals, and I think they will be wonderful people to continue the fight and the battles to give women the opportunities to continue that. And I was given an award early on in the 80s by the uh, YWCA, and I was given it Women of Achievement in a Non-Traditional Career. And today, my career (laughs) as a coach is normal. It is not non-traditional So the women today have lots of opportunities. I want them to take advantage of them and to continue helping making things in whatever area that they choose to make it better for the people that follow them. That's great. 
Well, thank you very much, Sue, for joining us today. We are so grateful for your time and grateful for you sharing your journey with us. So thank you. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun, and um, I hope to be a little bit more of a part of helping Pomona Pitzer. That's awesome. We will take you. Uh, so thank you, listeners, for tuning in today. Uh, visit sagehands.com to learn more about our programming celebrating the 50th anniversary of Title IX. We'll see you soon.